Hello everyone, welcome to yet another session of the daily news analysis by Sri Ram's IS, where we take up the important articles featuring in the Hindu newspaper and break them down for our understanding from the UPSC examination point of view. So let's start our today's discussion by taking the important articles which feature in the New Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper. And with this, let's take up our first article for the day, which reads a conservation bill that endangers forest rights. Now, this particular article appears in the editorial section of the newspaper and talks about the Wildlife Protection Amendment 2021 that has been recently passed in the Rajya Sabha. So, this sets the context of the article where recently Rajya Sabha passed the Wildlife Protection Amendment Bill of 2022 which seeks to conserve and protect wildlife through better management of protected areas and rationalized schedules which list out species under the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. So this is the context of the uh, article which, uh, which is why it is appearing because the government is amending the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. This piece of legislation is a very important piece of legislation when we talk about the set of environment laws or wildlife laws in our country and we know that the Wildlife Protection Act has played a big role in conserving the species up until now be that the project tiger or other animals so whatever uh, conservation efforts that we are seeing the protected areas that we look at national park wildlife sanctuaries all of them find their recognition and institution under this particular act that is why amending this particular act becomes uh, important from the point of view of environment and also from the point of view of e examination as well so through this article we we'll understand what exactly is the wildlife protection act and its amendment all about what are its features of the amendment what new features are being added into this new act then what is the article trying to say the article is actually trying to highlight certain issues with respect to this amendment so we'll take a look at what the uh, articles uh, what the authors want to say and some other issues as well and holistic and uh, we'll take a holistic view of this particular amendment so let's start and let's understand the features of the bill now one important aspect that we need to note before starting is that whenever we talk about regulating forest or regulating wildlife it is should be noted that earlier forest and protection of wildlife came in the state list but this was changed and added into the concurrent list in from the 42nd amendment act in 1976 so this was done which paved way for the uh, wildlife protection act which is a national legislation a parliament uh, parliamentary act which conserves the animal species and talks about protection uh, protected areas so this is the change that was done which gave uh, which paved way for the wildlife protection act now the amendment bill is there and let's understand what are the important features of the wildlife protection amendment bill of 2022 so obviously whatever features were there earlier uh, the government wants to strengthen these features and that is why certain new features are added and one of them is the implementing the provisions of sites now sites or the convention of international trade in the endangered species is an international agreement between governments to ensure that international trade in specimens of wild animals and plants does not threaten the survival of the species the sites convention is a very important convention because it balances two things the trade in uh, exotic species and wild animals and uh, at the same time also manage that their population does not deplete to a level where uh, they are they are becoming extinct so this balance is achieved by this particular agreement and india is a party to this international agreement and therefore certain provisions have been uh, added into this amendment bill in order to implement this particular convention so trade fe features with respect to wild animals have been incorporated then the bill also provides much more power at the hands of the central government central government uh, since this is a central legislation so the powers of the central government have been enhanced in this particular bill and now the central government can designate a management authority which grants export or import permits for the trade of these specimens again flows from the implementation of this uh, sites convention then the central government can regulate or prohibit the import trade possession or proliferation of invasive alien species the problem of invasive species in india and around the world is well documented and well known by now where we know that certain species belonging to different part of the world have inhabited uh, inhabited 
another part of the world and in consequence what they've done is they've caused much damage to the native species and the whole ecosystem of that particular area so the invasive alien species are right now a big threat to the world environment and that is why more protection or power is needed with respect to regulating of these invasive alien species so in the new bill the central government has kept with itself the power to regulate on trade import and possession of these invasive alien species then the central government may also notify a conservation reserve what is a conservation reserve which typically act as a buffer zone or connectors or migration corridors between established national parks and wildlife sanctuaries the areas between them are typically known as conservation reserves so these are the additional powers at the hands of the central government then another feature is that it reduces the number of schedules from 6 to Four now. This is one important aspect. Earlier, UPSC has asked a question on the schedules of the Wildlife Protection Act. So earlier, the schedules were six in number, and now they have been reduced to four. What has been uh, so earlier? Six schedules had one for protected plants, specially protected animals had four, and vermin species had one. What do you mean by vermin species? The vermin species means that those small animals that carry disease and destroy food. Now, what are these schedules? These schedules mentioned under the Wildlife Protection Act actually contain certain names of certain animals or plant species, and uh, those which are mentioned under Schedule One have the highest protection and. the level of protection keeps on decreasing or changing as we change the schedule so these uh, this is the role of the schedule and now the schedules are being altered so what is the state of the new schedule now now there are four schedules where schedule 1 will will have those animal species that will enjoy the highest level of protection so we know that the tiger great indian bustard elephant all are accorded the schedule 1 status which means that any alteration with respect to these animal species is accorded with the highest of penalties and therefore they are said to have accorded highest protection so they are under schedule 1 then we have the schedule 2 which would have animal species that would be subject to a lesser degree of protection right that would be in schedule 2 and schedule 3 will have protected plant species first two uh, schedules are for animals and third is for plant species and schedule 4 has specimens listed in the appendices under the sites convention so the sites convention species have been given a separate space under schedule 4 and the vermin species which were earlier there in the uh, schedule 6 of the earlier wildlife protection act those have been removed and those are not mentioned under the new schedule so what would uh, be the regulation with respect to the vermin species the central government would take case by case decision on these vermin species this forms a part of a major issue with respect to this bill we'll take a look at as we go forward then another feature is exception for the trade of live elephant so apart from elephant the uh, previous act did not have uh, specifically prohibited trade in wild animals including captive and wild elephants so under the act uh, trading and transferring of every kind of animal was prohibited but under the new act this particular bill has allowed for commercial trade in live elephants and it therefore allows for commercial trade in elephants which means that apart from uh, apart from elephant all other animals are banned for trading but elephant has been made an exception with respect to this so this is a change in the new bill and then the another feature is that for sanctuaries falling under scheduled areas which means that i scheduled areas is uh, uh, falling under either schedule 5 or schedule 6 so under these areas the forest right acts is applicable and comes under the fifth schedule so for those sanctuaries falling fall, uh, falling under this areas the management plan must be prepared after due consultation with the gram sabha concerned so this has been made as a separate condition for those sanctuaries which are existing under the fifth schedule then states can declare areas adjacent to national parks and sanctuaries as conservation reserves which we saw earlier as well then the major feature of this particular bill which has drawn attention of a lot of expert is that the penalties mentioned under the wildlife protection bill has been increased from the previous version of the act so earlier for general violation where the fine was 1 lakh now the fine has been changed uh, fr- from 25000 it has been changed to 1 lakh and for specially protected animals from 25000 it has been changed to uh, from 10000 it has been changed to 25000 so the quantum of penalties have been increased in the new act 
again why this has been done to cause a higher level of deterrence increased penalties is expected to cause more deterrence with respect to illegal poachers or people who uh, capture animals for illegal trade this has been done to deter them now these are the major features with respect to the wildlife protection bill of 20, uh, amendment bill of 2022 so what are then the issues with this bill now here is where the article comes in which tries to highlight certain issues which this new bill has where it, it says that this particular bill contains certain issues and first is that the exemption given to the live elephant for commercial trade is a problematic one because the parliamentary standing committee headed by Jairam Ramesh objected to the blanket exemption recommending to the limit it only temple elephants kept for religious purposes. This has been the objection made by the parliamentary standing committee. So that is one uh, challenge. Second is the centers hold over vermin declaration continues. As we saw now the vermin schedule has also been removed. Therefore, every uh, aspect with respect to whether some species should be considered vermin or not would be decided by the center and therefore Kerala's request for declaring wild boars as vermin have been turned down repeatedly by the environment ministry and again this causes bit friction between the state and the center with respect to declaring certain species as the vermin species this is uh, another one and the next one is the bill severely curtails the ability to graze across pastoral spaces in the conservation areas now we come to the one of the most major issue with respect to this bill which stands as the core of the article is that this particular amendment bill has a negative impact on the tribal communities or those forest dwelling communities which are often living or inhabiting in these protected areas or forest how do they get impacted it is seen that uh, through a study that was conducted by the criminal justice and police accountability uh, which was conducted in the state of Madhya Pradesh. This study points out that whenever certain penalties are levied under the Wildlife Protection Act and now through the new amendment these penalties are often increased. It was seen that although uh, criminalization of certain activities under the act is necessary but this study pointed out that in most cases innocent or not so guilty forest dwelling communities were taken under the custody with respect to crimes that were purported to com committed under this act and oftentimes it was seen that these particular penalty provisions or penal provisions were unfair to these forest dwelling communities. To take an example, in a case from 2016 documented by this project, it was seen that five men were apprehended by a range officer and beat guards as they sat across a fire with fish they had caught from the river nearby. So just by uh, just for catching a fish, they were apprehended by the uh, forest police. They, that catch weighed less than 500 grams, yet the accused were charged with causing damage to wildlife habitat under a host of Wildlife Protection Act provisions. This particular example is to show that it is not that these penal uh, provisions are not right or they shouldn't be there. They are equally important, but evidence suggests that it is mostly the forest dwelling communities which are taken under the unfair practices with respect to these particular penal provisions which cause a detrimental impact on the existence of these forest dwelling communities and therefore it's a direct attack on their co collective rights and forest rights which are mentioned under the Forest Rights Act. Therefore, unchecked discretionary policing allowed by this act and the other forest legislations have stunted the emancipatory potential of the Forest Rights Act. The true potential of the Forest Rights Act had, has not been able to achieve because of these practices. And therefore, what is required is that any further amendments must take stock of the wrongful cases as in the case of fishing and resultant criminalization of rights and lives of forest dwelling communities. These, uh, this is the just discussion with respect to what the article tried to say. We took out their issues and we also understood what are the important provisions of this amendment bill. So we finished the article over here and with this let's move on to our next article for the day. The next article which appears in the newspaper reads, Aurobindo inspired many generations, left his mark wherever he went, says Prime Minister Modi. Now why is this article appearing in the newspaper? Because recently on December 5, we celebrated the death anniversary of Aurobindo Ghosh. He's a, he was a celebrated poet, spiritual, uh, spiritualist and a freedom fighter as well. And why this article or the context of Aurobindo Ghosh becomes important is that because Aurobindo Ghosh, these are some of the photos of the freedom fighter. 
why this article or why the freedom fighter Aurobindo Ghosh becomes important is that he was born on 15th August 1872 and the year 2022 marks the 150th year of his birth anniversary and on this occasion even the government of India had uh, marked for uh, had had uh, given certain projects to celebrate the 150th year anniversary of Aurobindo Ghosh and if the government is giving impetus to this particular man even this particular topic becomes important from the examination point of view so from the uh, from the exam point of view we'll take a look at a brief view of uh, Aurobindo Ghosh's life and his contributions so let's understand that so as we saw he was born in Calcutta on 15th August 1972 and he was a yogi seer philosopher poet and an indian nationalist who propounded a philosophy of divine life on earth through a spiritual uh, evolution so orbindo ghosh was a unique personality who was initially a freedom fighter a, a learned educated freedom fighter who then renounced that particular uh, way of free, uh, struggling for national independence and adopted a more spiritual approach and later turned into a yogi after whom the famous ashram in pondicherry or which is now known as puducherry is situated so this was his journey so let's talk about his education first his education began in the christian convent school in darjeeling and he entered the university of cambridge where he became proficient in two classical and several modern european languages and in 1892 he held various administrative posts in baroda and calcutta and then he began the study of yoga and indian languages including in including classical sanskrit then after the education he took part in the indian revolutionary movement as i said he was earlier part of the freedom uh, movement so from 1902 to 1910 he partook in the struggle to free india from the british and as a result of that he was imprisoned in the 1908 alipore bomb case so this is an important fact that we can remember which can always be featured in a prelims question so two years later he fled british india and found refuge in the french colony of pondicherry which is uh, now named puducherry where he devoted himself for the rest of his life to the development of his integral yoga integral yoga is a unique kind of practices which is he which is said that he developed a kind of yoga known as integral yoga then started a journey of spirituality for him where in pondicherry he founded a community of spiritual seekers which took shape as the shri aurobindo ashram in the year 1926 but before he turned to spirituality some of the most important aspects which is attributed to him is his theory of nationalism because aurobindo ghosh was considered as a prophet of indian nationalism because along with bankim chandra bal gangadhar tilak and dayanand saraswati he developed his own theory of nationalism in india so this aspect becomes important for us to know that what was his theory of nationalism so he said that this his theory of nationalism was based on vedanta philosophy in the uh, uh, from the hindu scriptures which saw unity in and oneness in man and god so his idea of nationalism related a lot with the vedanta philosophy where he declared that india was in fact mother india which represented the united power and shakti of millions of her children and mother india represented the infinite energy of her people and he identified mother india with god and maintained that it was god's divine mission to set india free and he said that the village should retain its autonomy and self government but at the same time should seek to promote national cohesion and the idea of national swaraj must be modeled on the old village community which was self sufficient autonomous and self governing so we can see that his ideas had a similarity with respect to gandhi's ideas when it came to village autonomy uh, being the quantum of governance this was his idea of nationalism now let's talk about his literary works or those uh, magazines or newspapers which he was associated with so for a long time he was an editor for the newspaper known as bande mataram then he also wrote a book called basis of yoga and one of them he wrote many books but we'll take a look at only few which are important from the examination point of view and the most important one is his poem known as sabitri a legend and a symbol which was a long poem of 24000 lines this was said that it was a quite long poem uh, to be written by him at that point of time so this becomes important for us to know this was a brief discussion which we had on the great man's life and what important points we can 
take out from the examination perspective. So we finish our discussion here and we'll meet again tomorrow with the important articles from the newspaper. Thank you.